Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 Giallo film, The French Sex Murders. This one. Uh, this is from, if people don't know, the volume two of Forgotten Gialli by uh, Vinegar Syndrome that they put out. And thus far, I enjoyed-ish the first volume. I'm actually thinking that at the moment I might be enjoying the second volume more and I have a review for the first one, this is the second one, and then I'm going to be doing the third one, so I'll have all those available. And, and also, if you're finding this uh, as the first video you've seen on my channel, just know that I have an entire playlist on there for Giallo film reviews, so I'm big into Giallo. So let's talk about this one. I'm a fan. I, I did enjoy this one. It doesn't crack my top ten or anything like that, but I will rewatch this one. It's a good time. It's fun. So The French Sex Murders, like I said, done in 1972. Directed by Ferdinando Marighi. Uh, this was written by Marighi and also Marius Matei, who also wrote scripts for The Daughters of Emmanuel and Moving Target, just to name a few. Also, Dick Randall, who wrote some scripts for Let It All Hang Out, The Mad Butcher, The Erotic Adventure of Robinson Crusoe. Hadn't heard about that one when I was a kid. <laughs> The Real Bruce Lee, which is a documentary, which is interesting, and Pieces, which people may know about Pieces. It is a Giallo film. I do plan on doing a review for it at some point. I think it's still on Shudder, that one by uh, Piquer, Javier Piquer, I think is his name. Anyway, I, I do like that one. I will do a review on it at some point. So, the police chase off the bat in this film is definitely setting a stage for a killer on the loose situation especially uh, with the high-paced music that they kind of have. It's very, like, upbeat, like, get your blood pumping, you know, get things exciting type music that's going on where the chase is going on. Now, obviously you find out in the end that uh, this is the what ends up happening in the end of the film, chronology-wise, where they're chasing whoever, you know, they end up finding out is the actual killer, which ends up being Theodore, the professor, and, yeah, they're on the chase, but they obviously make sure they don't show his face at, at that point. Um, but it's an interesting way to start the film because it gets you into action immediately. It pulls you in, it grabs your attention, and it lets you know that this isn't going to be your typical, you know, just take its time, there isn't a whole lot of excitement going on type giallo film. It's It says to you, there's going to be a lot more to this. It's going to be more interesting, more engaging, and that's, I think, what ends up happening. The jump from the Eiffel Tower, though, it, it just looks really weird and funny. Uh, just a sign of its times, because it's 1972. Obviously, at that time, that was probably a big deal. It probably looked really good back then, where that like shadow was coming at you, and they play it again at the end. So I laughed at it, just because nowadays it looks funny, but I realized it was probably pretty good back then. Oh, a thief with a scar on their face. This seemed like the red herring candidate immediately to me, even before anything happened, before anyone was dead, we see Antoine stealing the jewels that he ends up giving to Francine, and they make a point of showing that he has a scar on his face, so I figured he's stealing, he has a scar on his face, this guy is clearly going to be their main red herring that they go after, and that's exactly what ended up happening. These things are so predictable sometimes. Uh... But, you know, it's still fun. It was a good time. I love the flashy druid robes for concealing identities for a trip to the Massage Palace. Uh, that was Madame Colette's, which basically, it's a brothel, as we all know. And you find out at the end, obviously, that in those cool, flashy druid robes are Theodore and George, who, unfortunately, I mean, it seems like they were great friends, so I'm sure it really sucked for Theodore to have to go and kill George, although he was kind of, you know, out there at the end, so um, maybe he wasn't thinking about George all that much in the end. Antoine steals for Francine and says, mine, 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 while he's having sex with her, uh, which really sets it up as showing him as being obsessed with Francine, as being very possessive of Francine, uh, especially when he ends up hitting her because his time is up and she's like, you know, I got to go back to work. I'm having sex with other men. And he just flips because he's just spent this time with her. He thinks that bringing her these jewels will bring her closer to him. He obviously has this obsession that's not being um, reciprocated, basically. Uh, he just keeps saying all these things about like going her going away with him and all that. And then the whole thing with saying mine, mine, mine while they're having sex. 
Uh, yeah, it just, it's another step in them trying to really paint him as he's the killer, he's the guy who did it. And then obviously with how they edit the chain of events that happen, where, you know, he beats the crap out of Francine, and then he runs out of the house, and then her body's found not long after that. So obviously he was the last one seen with her, he was seen running out of the house, he did actually hit her, the audience sees that, and so you're supposed to believe, obviously he is the killer, obviously he killed Francine, but he didn't. He's a terrible guy, but he didn't commit the murder, so yeah. If the police in a Giallo film say the case is cut and dry, which they do in this film, it most certainly is not. Uh, the other thing to note, which I talk about in other Giallo reviews, is that Police are very inept. They're almost always very inept within the film, at least initially within these types of films. Most of them, the whole time, they're pretty inept. But in this one, it was actually kind of more refreshing to see that they weren't, that the detective was actually pretty solid at what he was doing. What was his name? Um, I have it in my notes at some point. I'll come across it and talk about him. I can't remember his, his name at the moment, but I'll get there. Um, I like how the police don't make any attempt to run after Antoine. They just slowly walk towards him. That's when he first ran out of Madame Colette's and he's running. Then the police start coming for him. Like, they weren't running at him or anything. They were just, like, slowly walking towards him, which I thought was, like, a weird strategy because he is running. They are not. I mean, I guess it from the standpoint of they knew that they had him closed off because you had police on one side and police on the other. But then again, did they know? Because they didn't have, like... They didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't have walk. They didn't appear to have walkie-talkies with them. I don't know. It it just seemed a little odd to me that they would just be walking at him. Weird. Uh, Madame Colette talking about having a party at her place after giving her statement on Antoine and Francine's death seems like a pretty quick mood change. And for that reason, it did at that moment seem to me like maybe she would have something to do with Francine's death. Maybe some sort of personal grudge or something like that, uh, because that seemed like an odd character thing. But then again, as we all know, if we know Giallo, there's always these weird, quirky characters who do weird, quirky things, and that's just another one of them. It's, you know, obviously Madame Colette is not that broken up over losing Francine because she's wanting to just throw a party after that. The color changing when Antoine is giving his curse that kind of goes to like a reddish orangish hue uh, at the trial, um, I took that as kind of a show, not, it, it was, I felt like it was a little bit of like a showing of Antoine's anger and how he was funneling it at these people, but also I think it was used as a visualization of kind of like a potentially supernatural thing going on because that's when he's laying this curse on them that obviously Theodore ends up using to try and throw people off and make them think, oh no, Antoine's curse is is coming true, and that's why all these people are dying, not because anyone else killed Francine. Yeah, so. Which is an interesting aspect of the film, and I like that for the story. It's not believable, obviously. It's not believable that people would believe that there's an actual curse, but it's interesting nonetheless. Um, and I hadn't seen that done before, so yeah. Uh, when it's revealed Antoine escaped, you think uh, he's got a grievance and a list of names, so let's get it on. I thought what was going to end up happening at that point is that he Antoine was going to go on a tear and actually start killing those people that he listed for his curse, and then you would end up finding out in the end who actually killed uh, killed Francine, or that he would basically go and become his own detective in a way. But no, we get that very interesting twist that I did not see coming of him riding the stolen motorcycle that he got coming across uh, around a turn and then having, I don't even know what it was. Like I couldn't even focus on, was it a construction site? Was it, it looked to me like it was a sharp piece of metal coming out of the back of like a, a garbage truck or something. I don't know. It was too fast for me. All I know is a piece of me sharp metal was there. He turned, didn't see it in time, and pff, pops his head right off, which I thought was a really cool moment, not just story-wise because he didn't see it coming, but for 1972, it actually didn't look too bad. And the way they shot his body on the motorcycle, like on the side in the grass, 
they they got it at a good angle where it did look like he didn't have his head anymore and this like the sculpt of the of the actual like severed head that they used the practical effect looked pretty good for the time i thought so i was pretty impressed with that oh by the way before that happened antoine uh getting past all the police on the motorcycle was like kind of slapsticky type funny because they looked like total buffoons like with how many there were they definitely would have been able to catch him especially in the situations that unfolded there with that um but it's just kind of the slapsticky idiotic funny type thing which adds to the quirkiness of the film and i and i did like uh i uh sorry it took a long time for pepe to come to eleanor's defense at the bar that moment where um Marianne is singing and she's like looking at Pepe, but then Eleonora is there with, I don't know who this random guy was, I think just like drunk bar patron, the guy with the mustache and the blonde hair, and he was um, just like getting all handsy with her and Pepe was seeing it. Like they were making a point of showing you that Pepe was seeing it, but kind of being bothered by it, but he was also really wanting to focus on Marianne and I guess kind of not caring enough to do anything about it, but he eventually does and, like, gets on the guy when they stand up, but it went on for a long time, so he's not really, like, a hero in that aspect. It kind of seemed more like he was waiting for someone else to jump in and intervene, and then he was like, oh, God, fine, I guess no one else is going to intervene, I'm going to have to do this. So, yeah, but also I love how the guy stopped for a few seconds when he was harassing Eleonora, he stopped briefly to clap for Marianne's song and then went right back to sexually harass or trying to sexually harass her. It's just another one of those weird, quirky little moments that I laughed at. I loved it. I like that aspect of it. It's just ridiculous. What's the issue with Roger? Roger. I'm just going to call him Roger, but they say Roger in the, in, in the film. Uh, what's the issue with Roger trying to be with Eleonora? I just don't get it. Like, I didn't understand what the taboo was there, at least not at first. So then I guess at the end, it kind of starts to make sense that it's just because, really, Theodore, Eleanor's father, doesn't want her being with anyone because he wants to be with her. Yes, like that. Ew, creepy, ew, disgusting. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit here. <laughs> the repeat shots of the bottom of the lamp coming at Madame Colette are annoying. Uh, when she gets bludgeoned to death with the lamp, um, the the changes, and they did that with pretty much all the kills where it changes colors. I think it was like blue, red, uh, like a purplish. It, it went through a bunch of colors, but um, I did not like that aspect of it. I, I don't know what the real reasoning was that was. Like, what was the real reason for that in the end? I don't know, um, but... I guess to show the craziness of the situation, just to kind of like exacerbate it through some visuals. I don't know. I didn't really dig it. It was distracting and disorienting. I didn't like it. The eyeball cutting scene, pretty nasty. Gets pretty gross. Like they're literally taking that scalpel and like squishing the eyeball in essence and all that like fluid comes out from the inside. Uh, ugh, that was pretty gross. I'm assuming it was like a sheep's eye. I know back then that that's what they would use in Italy, when they would do scenes like that, it had been done before, so um, I assume it was like a sheep's eye, but um, yeah, looked pretty grody. I'm sure some people got squeamish during that. Uh-oh, uh Pepe is cheating on Marianne with Alice. I didn't see that coming, some infidelity, but then again, when the film's called The French Sex Murders, and there's a uh, brothel in at the center of this whole thing, I guess you should expect something like that. I like the shot where um, the person moves up the stairs next to the open door and then flicks their switchblade open. It looks cool. So that's the moment where, well, we find out later who it is. We didn't, we don't know who the killer is at this point, but it was Theodore uh, going up the stairs and standing next to Doris's bedroom where Mike Martin slash Mike is. I don't understand that. She literally later says that. Her boyfriend's name is Martin, but she calls him Mike when they have sex. I don't I don't think that was actually what was going on, though, because when he initially shows up, he says something about um, her 
her man be, not being around or something. But then again, they could have been referring to George because that was Doris. That was George's maid. So, I don't know. That was a little bit confusing, but her explanation, at least, of, oh, his name's Martin, but I call him Mike when we're having sex it was so random. Just another one of those weird things. But anyway, going back to what I was initially saying, when Theodore goes next to the to the uh, how they shot it, he's next to the open door, and then he's standing there, and he puts his hand out, and then it just like the switchblade is just like switchblade flicks out. It looks cool. It was a real done, real well done shot, and that goes to one of the big things with this. I think the directing is pretty good in this film. A lot of good, interesting camera movements. A lot of zoom in, zoom out, but not excessive. Because a lot of films back then, they kind of got real excessive with the zoom in, zoom out. Uh, they did a good amount of those, but they didn't feel like they were too much. And they weren't over-exaggerated or too fast when they did them. So I did like it. Cinematography looking good. So I thought it looked really good. I was pretty impressed with that aspect of the film. Fontaine. Okay, Fontaine is the detective's name. So when Fontaine tells Randall he wants to meet with him later... I had a feeling he would never make it there. That is one of those things I talk about in these Giallo reviews, which is if someone says they have something to tell you later or if they say they want to meet with you later or anything like that, trust that most likely they are not going to make it. They will be killed very soon. That's usually what ends up happening, and that's what ends up happening to Randall. Uh, Randall doesn't get the best death, though. I think the best death ends up going to Marianne when she gets her head lopped off. But I'll talk about that in a second. First, we need to talk about the fact that Marianne goes over to Randall's house when he's with Tina and is about to start having sex and seems to be a bit put off by the fact that Marianne wants to talk, even though it's a pretty serious discussion. Uh, so I <laughs> I just like that he, at one point, doesn't even like ask her to leave or anything. He's just kind of like... You know, I got something to take care of. I think he literally says something like, I have something to do or I have something to take care of. And then goes to the next room, which isn't even really like the next room. There's just like a sheet that is separating these two rooms uh, between where Marianne is in this bed. And just like goes over to that next room and starts getting it on with Tina voraciously. His guest, Marianne, is still there. Like he can't even like see her out the door or say, please see yourself out, or anything like that. He was just literally like, hey, I got something to do, or someone to do. And then he just goes over and is just having sex. You know, maybe part of him was hoping that Marianne would kind of come in and be like, oh, may I join? I kind of think maybe that's what was going on, is that he was kind of like, maybe this will prompt her to come join. I don't know. But it, it just another one of those weird, quirky things in the film. But... It adds character. So then the scene with Marianne getting her head lopped off with the sword, which happens not long after Randall starts getting it on with Tina. Cool. I didn't. I did see it coming just because of the sword being grabbed off the wall. I was like, someone's getting it. I didn't necessarily know it would be Marianne or a head getting lopped off, but that was. It was a good scene. So that's two decapitations in this film. Good job. And then Randall gets it, but the way Randall didn't get it was. The, the, way, the way Randall got it wasn't the best, uh, but I understand that they did it the way they did it so that he was able to be alive for a little bit so he could do the M or the W as he was dying. So I get it, but his death wasn't the best. Um, Yeah, once again, really not sure why Doris calls Martin Mike during sex. I thought that was a weird kind of misdirect that they put in there, and I guarantee that's why they put it in there as the misdirect so that you would think for a bit that Randall in blood had put an M and not a W. But obviously it's found out not long after that. Theodore is one sick bastard. Wanted to bone his daughter. So basically what he ended up doing was that he was going to the brothel and having sex with the women there. And bas basically visualizing them as his daughter Eleonora. And then the actual murder ended up happening with Francine because he went to Francine. He seemed to be, like, mentally not there. He was actually picturing Eleanor's face on Francine's, was trying to have an interaction with her, and then things went bad for in, in his mind, and he just ended up killing her. So then once he realized that's what happened, obviously he got out of there, and then he needed to set this thing up with the curse that Antoine threw out there and 
be like, well, I need people to now think this curse was happening. So if you notice, he comments on the curse throughout the film too. I think to kind of like perpetuate it, to keep it in people's minds, to kind of introduce the idea more to people that this could be a real thing. You know, he even talks at one point where it was him, Randall, and Fontaine walking outside that he started talking about who was on the list and people should watch out type thing. So just saying. Uh, I like how they looped everything back to the beginning with the murder and then the jump off the Eiffel Tower, which I I didn't you know, say that until now. It was the Eiffel Tower. I do think it was kind of cool that they featured the Eiffel Tower in it, especially because it's called the French Sex Murders. So that works. Um, I already talked about the directing being good. Uh, oh, also with the camera work, um, I like the way they kind of moved around and with characters. That was very smooth and very interesting. I, I really like that aspect of it. Notice how George tells, or I'm sorry, how Theodore tells George not to take Antoine's curse lightly. And that comes at a point where they're playing chess. Now, once that was done, once that scene happened, I immediately thought it's got to be Theodore. Because the image of them playing chess, like it's a game of strategy, I think was trying to show how Theodore was playing this game of strategizing and trying to set things up with all these kills. Uh, also, he's, once again, like I was saying, is talking about this curse, is planning it in people's heads that it's the curse that's killing these people. Just saying. Roger reminded me a bit of Ted Bundy, by the way. Uh, that's kind of my finishing thought, the way he looked. Uh, so for a moment, I was like, I want to say that this guy might be the killer just because he looks like Ted Bundy, but I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. But he did seem a little weird from time to time. I will say that. Like the moment where, for whatever reason, they were able to have Antoine's head as a favor. Like George did Theodore the favor of allowing him to experiment on Antoine's head after he was dead. That was weird. Uh, but Roger is helping, or Roger is helping him with it. And that's when he's like, oh, I, I, I saw the pupils move. And Theodore's like, no, no, no. But then that, that's called back at the end, actually, because Theodore then makes some sort of comment about, the, about Antoine making him do it, which I think was just, you know, an alibi. Either he was, he did have some stuff mentally going on, and he was believing that Antoine was actually you know, forcing him to do things, or what I think is more likely, he was just trying to, you know, set up something for pleading insanity, basically. So, yeah, but he makes a comment about how, like, something about Antoine's eyes and how, like, he made him do it, and yeah, so. But anyway, like I said, I enjoyed this one. I thought this was a good film, uh, a lot of fun. I will watch this again. Uh, quite enjoyed it. So I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Go ahead and put it in the comments, or just Giallo in general, we can talk. Um, so out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a three star rating. I was between two and a half and three, but I think it's, it's fun enough. I'm going to go the three. I'm putting it at a three. So yeah, real quick, do me a favor, hit that subscription button. If you like this video or any video I've ever done, that is how you repay me. I really do appreciate it. Every time someone subscribes, I get an email. I look at that person's online profile and I say, thank you to this person. That is awesome. Because that's what keeps me motivated, seeing that more people are joining this kind of nerdy community that I'm trying to put together so we can talk nerdy horror stuff, because uh, that's the reason I started the channel, because I, I can't talk to anyone around where I live about this stuff. I really can't. So it's awesome when I get comments. It's awesome when I get subscribers. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Also hit the notification bell button, because that way you'll know when I'm putting up new videos, whether it's reviews or unboxings or any of that type of stuff. But yeah. Regardless, I really do thank you for your time uh, watching this video. It does mean a lot to me. And until next time, keep it brutal.